Hi guys, welcome to the Ants Canada Ant Channel. Now, I know you guys are eager to find out who won our ant love contest. We were giving away a free Omni All You Need starter pack and a free hybrid All You Need starter pack. We went through so many entries. Thank you guys so much. And a lot of them really touched our hearts. A lot of them made us laugh and a lot of them made us go, what the? I wish we could give out more prizes, but unfortunately we had to narrow down our favorites to two. And so, our winners for this year's What is Ant Love Contest are Sam Lyon, who wrote a great ant poem on what he or she thinks ant love is, because Sam could be either a girl or a boy. And our second winner is Gerard Wilson, who had an amazing entry on how ant love inspires his whole philosophy and attitude in life. Really great entry, so check it out. So guys, Sam Lyon, you won our Omni All You Need Starter Pack, and Gerard Wilson, you won our Hybrid All You Need Starter Pack. And these starter packs, guys, contain all you need from the moment you catch a queen to the moment they move into their full setup with a nut world and a formicarium. And for everyone else, thank you so much for playing. We wish you the best of luck on all of your end keeping activities this year. It's end keeping season once again, um, for those of you who are in the Northern Hemisphere. And up next is our video on our top five choices of feeder insects to feed to ants. Hi guys, welcome to another Ants Canada Ant video. Today I wanted to talk about feeder insects and what feeder insects are the best for pet ants. First, I wanted to go over what constitutes a good feeder insect. A good feeder insect possesses all of the following qualities. First, they are easy to feed and gut load. Second, they are easy to house. Three, they're easy to breed or buy. Four, they are pesticide free, meaning they are not pesticide resilient. You see, some insects can be carriers of pesticides that they ingest in their food and still manage to survive. And so you don't want to feed these insects that are full of pesticides to your ants. And five, ideally the feeder insects should be nutrient rich. Now let's start with what you see here. These ants are feasting on a superworm. Now I'm gonna group mealworms and superworms together because they're similar in various aspects. Mealworms and superworms are beetle larvae and are very popular ant food for experienced ant keepers and herb keepers and are found in most pet stores offering fish or exotic pets like reptiles or tarantulas. And they live off eating fresh vegetables, fruit, potatoes and carrots, and oatmeal. They also get all of their water from the veggies they eat. Housing mealworms and superworms is very easy. They only need a tub of some kind, a one or two inch layer of oatmeal which they live and dig in, a dish of veggies for gut loading, and perhaps a carrot or potato for water. Now this is a very good setup guys because it means there is no standing water in their enclosure which keeps odor down, mold at bay, and pesky gnats and mites at a low. Be sure to change their oatmeal every now and then so it stays clean and dry and remove any wilted or molding food. Mealworms and superworms are very easy to breed, mealworms being the easier of the two. The mealworms eventually pupate and turn into whitish or yellowish alien looking pupae, which soon hatch into dark brown beetles. And the beetles lay eggs, and these eggs hatch into tiny mealworms. I once had a tub starting with 50 mealworms, and the tub lasted me about a year because of them reproducing on their own. I do recommend though adding new mealworms every few months so there are fresh members in your mealworm colony. Now superworms are a bit more difficult to breed, but still easy. The superworms, upon reaching their maximum size, must be separated into its own container. Some people use pill containers. What you gotta do is you gotta let these superworms starve, so no food or water, and they've gotta be isolated in their own dry chamber. This causes the superworm to pupate and eventually turn into beetles. And these beetles can either be released back into their home container or released into their own new container so that all the superworms born after that will be of the same size and you can have a good system going. Because these guys are completely home raised, they are generally pesticide free, but make sure to wash the fruits and veggies you give them very well. Now the downside on mealworms and superworms is that of all the feeder insects listed in this video, these guys tend to be the least nutrient rich. They make a good staple food for ants, but it would be advisable to feed other feeder insects to your ants and not raise them exclusively on a mealworm superworm diet. As far as protein goes, I kind of see them as a rice or pasta or potatoes of the ant world. The ants will need more than just mealworms and superworms their entire life. Make sure to gut load the mealworms and superworms as best you can by offering them a variety of fruits and veggies every now and then. And your ants may appreciate the flavors resulting from the various things you feed your superworms and mealworms. 
But remember, if there's any rotting fruits or veggies in their container, you must remove them. The mealworm and superworm container has to stay dry and it has to stay clean. Alright, moving on to crickets. Commercially available crickets are perhaps the most popular insect feeders in the pet trade. Like mealworms and superworms, they can survive off eating fresh vegetables, fruit, potatoes and carrots, and oatmeal. They're also very easy to gut load. Their setup is pretty basic. A simple container or aquarium filled with egg cartons and toilet paper rolls or crumpled newspaper for them to climb on. And they require their food in a dish, but unlike mealworms and superworms, they do require a source of fresh water. You can offer water in a dish with a soaked sponge or cotton, or they now have these water gel balls which offer hydration to feeder crickets. One of the most frustrating things though is that because there is water in their setup, it attracts a lot of mold and tends to make the setup gross. So a cricket setup needs regular cleaning. Also, where there are crickets, there will be little gnats and possibly mites, which can be a nuisance. In addition to all of this, dead crickets will be food to gnats, mites, and mold, so it makes a cricket setup smell really bad. Also, females will have the urge to lay their eggs, and if there isn't a proper egg laying tray full of dirt, they will lay their eggs in their water sponge, which can be a waste, especially if you're trying to breed the crickets. I generally avoid the entire nightmare that is cricket breeding. I don't have enough time and patience required to breed them and clean up after them, so I simply order them from a pet store or a supplier. You can buy them in bulk, anywhere from a dozen crickets to up to 10,000 crickets, and at various sizes, from tiny pinheads, which are 1 or 2 millimeters in length, to full-sized crickets, which measure up to an inch long. I usually buy one or two dozen medium to adult-sized crickets and feed them to my ants over the course of one or two weeks, in which case their housing is simply meant to keep them gut-loaded and alive and not for breeding. If you would like to breed them, there's a lot of info online, but it essentially requires you to provide the females with an egg-laying dish or tray full of dirt or soft, moist medium. Tiny pinhead crickets hatch from these eggs in a few days, and before hatching, you can move the egg-laying trays to a new enclosure so that all the crickets will be roughly the same size as they grow older. Also, beware of never-ending chirping of the mature males as they sing to females. The upside is that crickets are a little bit more substantial nutritionally than mealworms or superworms. They're easier to gut load than mealworms or superworms as well, accepting a broad array of foods. They also sell gut loading products for crickets at pet stores and online. Now I personally don't feed this next feeder insect too often, but I have heard a lot of positive things about them. Termites. Termites tend to make good ant food. The thing about termites is they have a very specialized diet of decaying wood, paper, cardboard, and perhaps other such things whose main constituent is cellulose. There are thousands of different species and so their care can really vary. If you want, you could even catch a queen and king termite and keep a termite farm as food for your ant farm. Termites, unlike ants, have both a queen and a king who are married for life and live together in a single colony. Now, I fed termites to my ants in the past, but the easiest way, in my opinion, is to catch a colony and raise them in a piece of decaying log and slowly feed the workers to the ants over time. You'll need to pick a way at the log to get to the workers, and when you fed all the termites in the log, you can collect another decaying log. If you can catch termite alates during their nuptial flight, they make good ant food as well. The only danger with this, however, is the risk of termites containing pesticides since they will be caught from the wild. It may be assuring though that most termites tend to be sensitive to pesticides and will die upon exposure and not carry them in their living bodies. If you want to err on the side of caution, don't feed termites. Also, don't let them escape into your home. Termites tend to be quite nutrient rich, but I recommend that if you're feeding a regular diet of termites that you also offer other feeder insects to supplement. Now I personally choose to feed termite alates that I catch during nuptial flight and so termites are more of a seasonal treat for my ant colonies. Finally, my favorite feeder insect to feed ants are cockroaches. There's a great variety of feeder cockroaches available for ants, but I don't recommend feeding pest cockroaches that you find in your home as they may have been exposed to pesticides. The feeder cockroaches available are usually jungle or forest dwellers and act more like beetles. Madagascar hissing cockroaches, dubia roaches, lobster cockroaches, and red runners are examples of feeder cockroaches that are great for feeding pet ant colonies. Feeder cockroaches can be purchased online at reptile or exotic pet conventions, or if you're lucky, you can find them at a pet store. To be honest, cockroaches can be a little difficult to find, but once you find a supplier in your area, it's awesome. They may also be outlawed where you live, so make sure to check your state or local laws first to see if it's legal to keep feeder cockroaches. Their setup is usually simple. An aquarium with egg carton, toilet paper rolls, and crumpled newspaper, 
and they can be fed a variety of fruits, vegetables, grains, and can get their water from a slice of orange. They easily breed on their own and mature quite quickly so they can make excellent feeder insects for your pet ants. Be sure to clean their setup and change their cartons and rolls regularly to avoid mold, foul odor, and remove their feces. The great thing about feeder cockroaches is that they are very nutritious, and they are easy insects to gut load due to their acceptance of a broad array of different foods. They are also quite hardy and very long lived. I usually make roaches the staple diet for all of my ants, and then I supplement with the other insects mentioned in this video. For most keepers of exotic pets, cockroaches tend to be the favorite food source. Now before closing, I also wanted to mention insects to avoid feeding ants. Number one is flies. I've lost entire colonies due to feeding swatted flies from my yard. Turns out, flies are an example of pesticide resilient insects and can be avid carriers of pesticides. Even if the area in which you catch your flies does not spray pesticides, I would still exercise caution with feeding flies because flies can travel far distances and or pesticides can float in the wind, water, and the air. The exception to this are fruit flies. Fruit flies make a great food source for ants, especially for small ants. Fruit flies are also easy to breed and obtain. Another creature to avoid feeding to ants are earthworms, especially worms caught in an area where a golf course exists somewhere nearby. Just like flies, earthworms can carry pesticides. And so actually, I would discourage feeding any insect that you catch outside because you don't know if they will carry pesticides. Finally, I would also avoid feeding other ants to your ants. Now as cool as ants are, ants also tend to be not so nutritious or tasty. Overall, feeding your ants mealworms, superworms, crickets, termites, and cockroaches will help keep your ant colony healthy and growing. There are also other commercially available feeder insects like silkworms, waxworms, hornworms, which may also be suitable. It's important to offer a good variety though, especially because ants will have seasonal palates and may like a particular food item one day and completely change their mind and not like it another day. It's also important to feed freshly killed insects to ants because they're a great source of available and easily absorbable protein and other nutrients. In my experience, feeding freshly killed insects for protein is better than feeding only other protein sources like cooked meats. Ants seem to require insect food, so why not give it to them? Good luck with feeding your ants and have a happy anting season this year! It's ant love forever! See ya! Bon ant petit! Thanks guys for watching our new video on the top 5 feeder insects for ants. Be sure to check out some of our other videos on this channel and don't forget to visit antscanada.com. We've got a lot of great ant keeping supplies and there's tons of information there for all of you guys, especially who are beginning ant keepers. Oh yeah, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We release a video every first and third Monday of the month. Ant love forever!